Well, thank you, Jeremy, Brooke, Steve. Steve almost didn't make it with us tonight, not because of the plumbing in his heart, but the plumbing at his house. So let's, play, let's pray that the plumber comes out tomorrow and gets it all going for him, or Steve and Vicky might be swimming tomorrow. But uh, hey, turn in your Bibles this evening to Romans chapter 10. Uh, if you recall, last week we, we went through Romans chapter 9. Uh, that's pretty good how 9 comes before 10. Uh, but Romans 9, if you recall, I know sometimes y'all don't remember everything I say, but I'm going to remind you just a little bit. Uh, I told you last week that I didn't really want to preach from Romans chapter 9. I didn't really want to deal with the topic and the difficulty that Paul was addressing in, uh, in describing the reality that the Jewish people were in. If you recall, Paul, Paul began last week saying that he wished that he could be cursed so that his people, the Jewish people, could be saved. And in doing that, he gave us a detailed explanation of God's gracious election. Now most, I, don't, I shouldn't say most people, a lot of people you talk to are going to say that God's election is not gracious. In fact, it's not biblical. And let me just pause as we go into Romans 10 here. You see, Paul makes it incredibly clear, and I don't believe there's any accident on the, in the way that Paul formulated his letter or the way that the, the Holy Spirit inspired him, the words that he called for him to say. I don't believe there's any accident in any of the composition and translation and preparation of the word that God has given us here in Romans 9 and in Romans 10. In Romans 9, we read about the election that God chooses people. God chooses you. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you are living with Him, if you are a Christian, God chose you. But now Paul is going to go into Romans 10 and he's going to make explicitly clear that in order to come to faith in Christ, in order to have salvation, you have to choose God as well. You see, this is one of the greatest mysteries, maybe the greatest mystery in all of Scripture, how it all comes together and how it works that God chooses who's saved, but that we also choose. We're going to read the text in just a minute, but the first verse in Romans chapter 10 Paul actually describes praying uh, and his concern for the salvation of the Jewish people. If, 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 if it's only about God's election, then why in the world would Paul pray for them? If it's only about God's choosing, why would he pray? The reality is the incredible beauty and mystery in the way that salvation works. God chooses and we choose. And I can't explain all the details to you. Let me just give you a warning. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I don't want to criticize anybody, but if somebody tells you they have all the answers when it comes to this topic, they're wrong, okay? They don't have all the answers. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, and this is one of those secret things that belongs to the Lord. But in that, God does reveal truth to us. I want to say one more word. The most impactful thing I learned in all of seminary, okay? I spent five years getting my master's. I'm still doing my PhD. Lord willing, it won't be too much longer uh, until I have that. But the most impactful statement in all of seminary, you want to hear it? Anybody, anybody on pins and needles, right? There's a lot of things I could say. The most impactful statement was in systematic theology from Dr. Riley. And he was talking about election and free will, and whether God chooses to save us or we choose to follow him. And his words were, he said, he said, I, he says, I encourage you to dance in the middle. And that's the first Baptist that ever encouraged anybody to dance. I know that's a bad joke that's overused. But in any case, he said, I want you to dance in the middle. He said, when I preach a text that's on election, I preach about election. And when I preach a, te a text that's on free will and choice. I preach about free will and choice. The reality is, and that statement, for years I've been trying to figure it out. And that statement impacted me more than any statement in all of my time in seminary. And that's exactly what Paul makes explicitly clear to us as we move from Romans 9 into Romans 10. So let me read our text. Romans 10, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, my heart my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
Since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, Because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Now you've heard me quote those verses, those last few verses, almost every single Sunday and Wednesday that we've been together. You've heard them more times than you can even uh, begin to imagine. But we finally are at the text here in Romans. And we see as we get here, we see three points that I want us to look at explicitly clear. But remember, as we go through this, as we go through these points, as we look at these, these, this text, remember, Paul has just explained the gracious election of God to choose some for salvation and some who reject, whether it be for his glory or for another purpose. And Paul has just explained that the Jewish people are, are lost And they're not saved because of their father. They're not saved because of the blood of Abraham. There's nothing that saves them but faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, they've stumbled over the stumbling block that brings salvation to you and to me. And as he says that, Paul begins the next chapter saying, I, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. Never let The election of God stop you from praying from somebody else. You and I don't know who's chosen. You and I don't know who will accept and who will not. The reality is Paul knew that some would reject, but he continued to pray that more and more and more would be saved. So we see our first point here in the first four verses. If you miss Jesus, you miss salvation. Now we could say that's that's obvious, right? But it wasn't obvious to Paul's readers. It wasn't obvious to the Jewish people. And in reality, I think many of us who claim the name of Christ are stuck in the same problem and the same sin and the same pitfall that the Jewish people were. Listen to what Paul writes in verse 2. I can testify about them, the Jewish people, that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He says these people are not bad. We get this picture often as we read the New Testament. We read Jesus, the Gospels especially, and we read about these Pharisees and these religious leaders and these scribes and these these priests, and we think they're evil and wicked people, but they're not. Most of them are not. They believed They were doing exactly what God commanded. They believed that they were following God's will. And most of the people looked at them. The Pharisees were the ones that everybody in the Jewish nation looked up to. Because they were the ones that could follow the law and even go further. They were the ones who could please God. They were the ones that everyone wanted to be like. Because they were right in God's eyes that's what they believed and Paul says these people these people that I that I'm one of that I grew up with that I was trained with that I served with that I hunted Christians with they're zealous for God they desire to please God more than anything else the problem is they don't know how to do it And ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how zealous we are. It doesn't matter how uh, passionately we pursue Christ. It doesn't matter how uh, uh, much time and effort we put into pleasing God. If our object is not on Christ, if our focus is off in our efforts, we will fail. Because God's not going to say on that day of judgment, when you stand before His throne in judgment, He's not going to say, Steve, how many times did you read your Bible? 
Jeremy, how faithful were you to come to church? Brooke, how many people did you leave to Christ? Those things are important and they're essential to the Christian life. But he's going to say, he's going to look at the blood of Jesus. It's only the salvation that Jesus brings. Faith in the Son of God and his sacrifice that will, will set us right. There's no religious practice. There's no religious effort. There's no style of worship or style of dress or translation of the Bible or day of the week that we come together or any of those things that's enough to save you. And so many of us have fallen into the same trap that the Jewish nation fell into. I can't tell you how many people have said to me when I've asked, are you, a, are you saved? And they say, well, you know, I, I was baptized at so-and-so church. My, parent, my dad was a deacon at Amelia Baptist Church. Uh, so many, I, well, I'm a pretty good, well, I read my Bible every day. Yeah, I pray every day. And I, sometimes you want to grab them and shake them, you know, and say, that's not what I asked, right? You can't shake people. It's not polite. But sometimes, not, right now you can't even shake their hands. But, but, but sometimes, that's not the question I asked. I didn't ask about your dad. I didn't ask if you read your Bible. I asked if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the exact same thing that Paul is saying that his people, the Jewish people, he himself missed for so long. You remember when the Lord showed up to Paul on the road to Damascus. You remember he showed up in light and he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Lord, who are you? He knew it was God, but he realized in that moment he didn't know God. And he said, it's me, it's Jesus. The one that you've been persecuting. And at that moment, Saul knew he was no longer simply zealous. He was zealous with knowledge of the righteousness that comes in Christ. If you missed Jesus, you missed everything. For Christ is the end, the totality, the completion. The Greek word that's here is so much more than simply end. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Then verse 5, since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by him. What Moses is saying that Paul is quoting is he's saying, if you're gonna, you, have, you have to read the fuller passage to get the whole context, but he's saying, if you're going to live by this law, you have to keep the whole thing. And I don't know, uh, you know, we've read through, we've, I, I've read the Old Testament numerous times. I've read the book of Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy numerous times. And there's a lot of things to try and keep, right? Not to mention the countless other laws that the Jewish people have added. Moses says, if you want to be righteous, you have to keep every single thing here. I don't know about you, but I start going through the Ten Commandments and pretty quickly... I, 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 can't, I can't make it past number one without checking off, well, I've done that, right? We don't have to go far in the law of God to see that none of us can keep it. So we see as we move into verses 10, 5 through 10, the Lord is only found in faith. You see, Moses and Paul says, if you don't keep the entire law, if this is how you're trying to find righteousness, you have to be perfect, period. But of course we can't do that. Verse 6, but the righteousness that comes from spirit from faith speaks like this do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven that is to bring christ down who will go down into the abyss that is to bring christ up from the dead see what paul is saying here is the righteousness that comes by faith says you don't have to go to heaven to look for him you don't have to go to the abyss you don't have to go to hell to find him you can't go get you don't need to why look at the reason why you don't have to go look for jesus uh, but the verse six, but the righteousness that oh, we already read that, excuse me, verse seven, who will go down into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. And, and verse eight, on contrary, what does it say? You can't go up to heaven to find Christ. You can't go down to the abyss to get him. You don't have to because the message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying you don't have to go find Jesus because he's rating waiting right there for you. 
We don't have to go look for salvation because God came to the world taking the form of a man and, and the form of a servant and dying on the cross for your sins and raising from the dead three days later. You don't have to go look for him because he's already come to find you. Somebody should say amen. Nobody here wants All right, fine. All right, say it louder. You don't have to go look for him because he's already here. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. Paul says, this is what we've been telling you. This is what I said. This is what I shared with everyone I've come to and now I'm sending to you in Rome. He says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now we've heard this so many times. I, like I said, I've shared with you so many times. It's easy for it to lose power. But imagine you're one of these Jewish people who your entire life have been told you have to keep everything in this law. You better, not, you better not even get close to it. Oh, the Sabbath? No, you can't go visit your friend. That's too far to walk. No, we can't make any more food because we can't cook on the Sabbath. No, you've you got to go sacrifice. You've got to go give another uh, sin offering at the temple. Nope, you missed number 587. Go back. You've got to do all this, son, so you can get please God and be right with God. Don't you dare eat with one of those Gentiles. Don't touch that pig. And on, and on, and on. And the burden of the law that pull, has pulled you down your entire life, imagine that's you. And some of you can relate to that. You've grown up in church, but you felt the burden of religious requirements and practice pulling you down your entire lives. And when you hear the Gospel, Martin Luther, the great reformer, was, was, a, was, a, was a monk and a teacher and a theologian. And when he finally understood the grace of God, the freedom that he received, you don't have to do all these things. In fact, you can't do it to please God. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with his heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with his mouth, resulting in salvation. When Paul writes these words, and a Jewish person reads them. It's not, it doesn't just go right past them. They think, hold on a second. You can't just confess and believe. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. If you miss one, of, you've got to make it up. You have to be purified. You can't just go to Jesus. Paul says, that's exactly what you have to do. There's only faith. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's only in Jesus Christ that we can have hope. And you could say, yeah, but anybody can confess the name of the Lord. Anyone can say, yeah, I believe that. Of course it has to be genuine. Of course your faith has to be right. When Paul says, confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord he's not saying that you just got to shout it really loud he's saying that you're changed by the inside out to the point that you can't keep it in he's saying that you realize that God is exactly who he's that Jesus is exactly who he said he is that he's the one that you give your life to in in the first century in the Roman Empire to say that Jesus is Lord is to imply that Caesar is not Lord that your religion is not Lord, that your bloodline is not what's most important. There's so much in the statement to say that Jesus is Lord, because if Jesus is Lord, then nothing and nobody else is. When we say today that Jesus is Lord, we say that I won't be ruled by money. My, my fate is not determined by political parties or presidents or kings or, or pandemics. I won't be stopped because my life is threatened. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say that I'm not Lord of my life. 
It's exactly what Paul is saying when he says in Galatians 2.20 that I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say that I give every bit of my life to Him. And then to believe that God raised Him from the dead. Anybody can believe that Jesus died on a cross, right? Everybody dies. People saw Him die. to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, defeating sin and death. That's how we find righteousness. And that's how we find salvation. And that is how we come to the Lord. If you miss Jesus, you miss salvation. And you only find the Lord. The Lord is only found through faith. In Jesus Christ. And the incredible thing is that Jesus Christ is available for every single person. Remember, Paul has just described the reality in the previous chapter that some will be saved and some won't, that God chooses who his children are. But at the same time, Paul makes explicitly clear that the gospel is available to everyone. Look in verse um, 11. Scripture says, everyone who believes on Him will not be put to shame. Think about that. Everyone who believes on Him. This is a quotation from the prophet Isaiah. Everyone who believes the Lord will not be put to shame. That means they'll have what they claim. That means when the world comes to an end, they'll be proven right. Let's continue. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on Him. He's saying, the God that you thought was yours, Jewish people, the God that you made fun of, Greeks, that's the God of all of you. He's the one that created the world. He's the one that sustains the world. And He's the one that gives salvation to those who believe and those who call on His name. And then he quotes the prophet Joel. You notice how he quotes Old Testament passages. He could just as easily say everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But he quotes the Old Testament to show us that God's plan has been this way from the beginning. Okay, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm going to give you a real detailed Greek lesson. When Paul says everyone in Greek, you know what he means? Thank you, Amy. Everybody! Paul spent a whole chapter describing that some are elected for salvation and some are called to salvation. And for many people around this world, they're terrified. Because they say, I can remember one conversation I had uh, I won't share names, but one person who came, who said to me, he said, they said, how can I know that I am elect? And I didn't know how to answer. But the answer is, the answer from Paul, if you've called on the name of the Lord to be saved, you are chosen. You see, God chooses us, but we choose at the same time. Again, I can't describe every mystery to you, but the reality is, if you've called on the name of the Lord, you are saved. Not not most people who call on the name of the Lord. Not the majority of people. Not 99% of people. Not the good people who call on the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will probably be saved. No, will be saved. I guess we've heard that too often. I guess i got to quit quoting it. No one's getting excited like me. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the message of life that this world needs. I I can remember, I don't remember what text I was sharing from, but as we began in the the pandemic and, and the lockdown and being at home and and doing live services. One of, the, one of the first times we gathered over Facebook, I, I made the statement 
Something to the effect, basically, that those who don't have Christ, I don't know, they should be scared. If you don't know Jesus Christ and, and this virus is tearing through the world, you should be scared. On a good day, you should be terrified. But we have Jesus Christ. We have hope for eternity. We have life today. We have salvation secured and assured for us. And we have a God who's not far away, who we don't have to go dig around and search. We've got people all around us who are searching for the right answers, right? Searching for something to fill their lives. Like I like to quote for you every once in a while, they're looking for love in all the wrong places, right? It's good to have some people laugh at my jokes. They're looking for answers in all these places, and we have the answer. This gospel message that Paul proclaims to us and for us and with us, it should compel us to go and share and to let others know. Because we have the only message of life, the only answer to the problems in this world. And everybody who calls on that name, the name of Jesus, will be saved. If you're with us tonight and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you've never believed, really believed, really proclaimed your belief that Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead. You've never gone to Him and said, God, forgive me for what I've done wrong. I know I've messed up. I know I've fallen short. Please forgive me. You've never asked Him to come into your heart. You've never turned away from your past and looked forward to the future He has for you and the life He has for you. You've never said to Him, I give you Myself, and I want you to be the Lord, the boss, the leader of my life. I pray, I implore, I beg that you would do that tonight. There's no special way to do it. There's no tricky prayer or, or, or magic words. You just simply proclaim. You can even use Romans 10 as a model. You can say, Lord, I confess You. I proclaim You as Lord, as the leader of my life. And I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you paid the price for my sin. And I want to follow you. And Scripture tells us, if you come before the Lord genuinely and, and, and with, a pure, with pure desire and genuinely ready to be saved, you are. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whether Jew, Greek, poor, rich, black, white, yellow, green, blue, big or small, man or woman, child or adult, sick or healthy, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For those of you who, who are with us and you know you are saved, you've made that declaration, you have no doubt in your mind, let me just ask you, are you living in it or are you living by your religious righteousness? Where do you find your boast? Where is your a uh, 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 point of pride is it, it is it in yourself or is it in Christ are you keeping the message to yourself or are you giving it to others are you living like what Paul gives us in Romans 10 is real are you living a life under the conviction that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved I would venture to say that every one of us could be better stewards of the gift of the gospel. I, would, I know for a fact that we all need to be reminded of the goodness and the grace that God has given us. So let me encourage you to take this time to grow in the peace of God's salvation and to share it with somebody. Father, we come before you this evening I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the salvation that we have in you, for the life that we live knowing that we don't have to wonder. The assurance that I have made you the Lord of my life and I know that I am saved. Father, I pray that you would pull hearts into you, that you would save the lost tonight, that somebody who does not know you would confess their sin, would make you the Lord of their life, and would trust you 
to lead and guide them for the rest of their lives. And Father, that you would compel, that you would drive, that you would call the rest of us to live lives devoted to the reality that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That we would be faithful. That we would be a people changed. That we could declare with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith and the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, that our lives would be marked by the Gospel that has changed us and that can change the entire world. Father, that You would bring change in our lives and through our lives, that, that, that the revival and awakening we need in our world could begin right here at Amelia Baptist Church in Beaumont, Texas and spread out, that we would be able to be a part of Your great work of salvation. Let us be devoted to that in all of our lives, in every area, in every bit of ourselves. Father, we thank You. Let us not take for granted the gifts that You've given us. We love You and we praise You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Remember, uh, if you did make a decision for Christ, or you have anything that, that, that you need to pray with or any help, you can uh, reach out, you can email me, uh, you can get my email on our webpage, ameliabaptistchurch.org, you can send prayer requests in that way. If you need to talk to somebody about making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, text me or call me, 409-554-5859. I would love to talk to you. If you, if you made a decision for Christ today, let me know, let somebody know. I, I want to invite you to join us. We have our daily devotionals Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock. We're, we're, we're walking through the book of Colossians right now. We'll be back here on Wednesday at 6.30 again and Sunday morning at 10.45. Make sure you join us and invite somebody to join us. I pray that you would have a blessed evening. I love you all. We'll see you soon. Bye.